I don't think so. That is why I tell you that it is very important to join together. Because if each of us were to do things on our own, we would never resolve the problems that we have. I want to say something. What has made the problem worse is the lack of rain during these last four or five years. Some of us have to travel very far to find water, and others to find wood. And above all, if we have to attend the meeting, we do not have enough time to take care of our homes. And the children want to eat at night. And our husbands are off doing whatever it is they do. We have to prepare their food too. It is difficult for most of us to attend because of these reasons. If not, we would love to. Yes, but I did not say that you don't come because you don't want to. I understand that if you don't come, it is because you have problems. What I say is that when we call you to come to the meeting, if we all come and we talk about our problems, we can solve them together. <laughs> The main source of income for these women is the sale of wood. They go to the mountains every day, they cut it and pile it up, and they carry it to the market according to their needs. It takes them about two hours to walk the distance between their town and Harar. If sales go well, they can earn up to 50 cents a day. If they go poorly, they have to return home with the load on their heads. The money is used to buy salt and other basic foods that they acquire at the market. Harar is not only a Muslim island in the center of a Christian ocean, but it is a kind of city, a cultural state, a universe of particular customs and ways. Harari is spoken in Harar, a language that is only used in this region. The old suspicion of foreigners and the dark desire to remain isolated from the world have relaxed over time. It does not aspire to political independence anymore. Today, in Harar, nationalism is expressed like a discreet pride for conserving what makes them different and identifies them, but nothing else. Weddings have always been one of the opportune moments to express this culture. In his stories, Burton wrote about how rich Haredi men liked to marry very fat women, and that sometimes they had problems on their wedding night since they weren't able to locate the right spot. That's why there are so many cushions in the Haredi home, because the cushion is used to raise the wife's buttocks to facilitate the husband's job.
Both Burton and Rimbaud described the hyenas of Harad in their writings. For centuries, the hyenas would come close to the walls of the city to eat the garbage at night. It was the custom of certain men to feed the hyenas. Yusuf Nume is the only one left. Every day, he collects the remains of the unusable meat and bones from the slaughterhouse. On rare occasions, he kills a cow or lamb. When night falls, he calls the hyenas to eat. He knows them by name, and they come like trained dogs when they hear him call. Before, it was a custom. Today, it is a show that Yusuf repeats every night for the tourists who visit the city of Harar. With the daily sale of chat, Waleto earns $15 a week. Her real business is the trip that she takes to Djibouti to sell large amounts. To do so, she has to travel by truck to Diredawa, the new financial capital of the region. There, she must wait until the gates of the station are opened in order to take the train that travels only three days a week between Addis Abeba and Djibouti. The train is the economic engine of eastern Ethiopia. And the train was also the cause of the definitive decline of Harar. Its inauguration in 1917 marked the beginning of the end for the city. The train replaced the caravans, and the merchandise that would come and go from the Gulf of Aden stopped passing through Harar. The cars are mainly filled with people traveling to Djibouti for the same reasons as Waleto. From Ethiopia, and following different paths, eight tons of chat are exported to Djibouti daily. 
The small traders travel by train, those traders who do this sporadically and sell a poor quality of chat. Most of the eight tons of chat, which is primarily of high quality, travels by plane. Each one of these people needs to have a special license. Two out of every three of them do not have one and sell smuggled merchandise. Saeed Mohamed travels by train three times every 15 days and has been making the same journey for five years. He takes nine kilos of chat to Djibouti. On his way back, he smuggles clothes and electronic devices. Half of his earnings are used to bribe the customs officers. Sometimes they confiscate his merchandise anyway, and he loses everything. Asha Adi sells cabbage, onions, chili, potatoes, and chat. She has a license to sell everything except for the chat, which she hides among the vegetables. When the train makes a stop, the traders take advantage of the opportunity to sell part of their merchandise. Each kilometer that the train travels away from Diredawa, the price of chat is raised in the same proportion. In Harar, a kilo costs one dollar. In Djibouti, it costs twenty-five dollars. The construction of the railroad from Djibouti to Addis Abeba was marked by disaster since its beginnings in 1897. Menelik II wanted to modernize Ethiopia, and this train line was the symbol of modernity. The route to the Red Sea required the tracks to cross one of the most inhospitable territories on Earth. Each kilometer of the line required at least 70 tons of rails and enormous amounts of cement and water, which had to be brought in from considerably far distances. If the workers survived the heat, it was quite probable that they would die shot to death by armed band members of the Issa tribe, who were fiercely against the project. The court of Negus, kings and ambassadors, artists, architects, and adventurers have traveled on this train hoping to reach the imperial city, the capital of the last African empire. But today, it bears smugglers and traders like Waleto. It lacks aristocratic glamor. Nothing remains of its ancient splendor except the scorching heat of the rails and the slow beat of the rhythm of the crickets. Rimbaud never saw the train. He only made two trips to Harar, both on camelback. His last trip was made on a litter when he was sick with syphilis. He abandoned Africa without fulfilling his desires, the dreams he had when he had left Europe behind years before. Perhaps the day will arrive when I can peacefully drink in some old city where I will die much happier. I am patient and know how to wait. If my evil resigns itself, if one day I have gold, will I go north or to the country of vineyards? Ah, dreaming is shameful. It's pure loss. If I become the traveler who I once was, let no inviting inn open its doors to me.
Now I am accursed. The motherland appalls me while the best thing is to sleep drunk on the sand. Yeah, yeah, yeah.